Thank you.
Good day and welcome. My name is Paul Farber. I'm the director of Monument Lab. Welcome to the second annual Monument Lab Town Hall. We are grateful to be gathered together with all of you. We are connecting from all over, across time zones and regions. And for us, Monument Lab is based in Philadelphia, which is located within the ancestral lands of the Lenni Lenape people. Despite a treaty of friendship between English Quakers and the Lenape, meant to last as long as the creeks and rivers flow and the sun, moon, and stars endure, within a generation, the colonial leaders of Pennsylvania dispossessed the Lenape of these lands, including through theft and deception. In Philadelphia, during the colonial era and later as an American city, enslaved Black Americans coercively built and labored here, including steps away from our Independence Hall. We recognize today something many other attendees may also register about their own home cities and towns, that in a conference about how the past impacts the present, we are connecting now with you from stolen lands built and worked by stolen hands. This year's theme of the Monument Lab Town Hall, Shaping the Past, picks up on the questions of how we represent and transform legacies of history. Over the next two days, we will be holding three hours of public programs each day. We'll explore what, who, and how to remember in public spaces around the world. We will share conversations on new models and practices for how we might shape the past in ways that can continue to confront and repair legacies of racist, sexist, and colonial systems of knowledge and also to insist upon and lift up the vital necessity of democracy, representation, joy, and art making throughout public spaces. This year's conference initiates a project of the same name, Shaping the Past, a collaborative initiative in partnership with Monument Lab, the Goethe Institute, and the Bundeszentrale für Politische Bildung, the German Federal Agency for Civic Education. We have worked together to bring you this conference and a host of programs kicking off today. This partnership began with a trip for our 2019 Monument Lab Fellows to Berlin two summers ago and continues now with other exchanges, programs, and events like this one. For today and tomorrow for the Monument Lab Town Hall, you'll hear from artists, curators, one neuroscientist, and other key members of the Monument Lab community. Each day, we'll have two keynote panels, which will be separated by a video program that features the 2020 Monument Lab Fellows. And in this moment of reckoning and reimagining of public memory, these are the transnational artists, activists, and visionaries to follow. And you can see their projects and videos about their work on the websites for Monument Lab and the Goethe Institute of North America. This is a special week for Monument Lab. We are here with all of you for our town hall in honor of our fellows. We also received the amazing news earlier this week of a transformative grant from the Mellon Foundation as the inaugural uh, initiative of a $250 million monuments project. In partnership with Mellon, we'll be conducting a national monument audit in the United States. Today in this transnational gathering, we're eager to also make connections across borders to learn from and map out transnational memory at work. Before proceeding with Town Hall, we wanna make sure to thank our supporters. The Serdna Foundation, whose grant in 2018 made the Fellows Program possible at Monument Lab. We also thank the Center for Public Art and Space at the University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design. We thank our partners, SLOT, the Institute for Contemporary Art Philadelphia in 1014. And of course, our partners at the Goethe and BPB. Now for a video greeting from our colleague, Secretary General of the Goethe Institute, Johannes Ebert. Dear friends, dear colleagues, Welcome to the public kickoff event for Shaping the Past, the Goethe Institute's collaboration with Monument Lab and the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung. 
I would like to begin by thanking our partners for their tireless work on both this event and the project as a whole. We are excited to have this platform to come together with our partners from North America. For those of you who are unfam unfamiliar with the Goethe Institute, we are Germany's cultural institutes worldwide. One of our core missions as an organization is to create a space for dialogue, support the voices of experts and emerging artists in their fields and enable people to be part of the conversation. Our place is not at the forefront of the conversations themselves, but rather as a facilitator and an active listener to explore ways that we can do better. Germany has a long history of coming to terms with its past. Much of our focus in the field of memory culture has been considering how to memorialize and hold space for remembrance of the Holocaust. We understand that the past is never truly behind us. It is never a closed chapter. We have looked on at the situation in North America with interest because while Germany has come a long way, we too have a great deal to reckon with. German colonialism, for example, is a topic that needs much further reflection. Our Latitude Conference on Rethinking Power Relations for a Decolonized and Non-Racist World earlier this year was a milestone, marking the culmination of several events the Goethe Institute has supported on these topics. We are excited to continue the work in the context of memory culture over the next two days of keynote conversations and one month of digital and in-person events hosted by Goethe Institutes throughout North America. We are beginning on Indigenous Peoples Day with events throughout the week organized by the Goethe Institutes in Los Angeles and Mexico City and continuing throughout the rest of the year. I will close by once again thanking our partners Monument Lab and Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, as well as 1014 in New York City, the Thomas Mann House in Los Angeles and the 2019 and 20 Monument Lab Fellows, with whom we are collaborating on the events throughout North America during Memory Month. And of course, I want to thank my colleagues at the Goethe Institute for their work in this <coughs> project. I am deeply convinced that dealing with our own past and history is absolutely necessary to create the foundation of a bright and just future. We hope that these events can deepen the discourse on memorial culture, provide a transnational exchange and lead to positive change. I wish you fruitful discussions and exchange over the next days. Thank you, Johannes, and to all of the staff and teams at the Goethe Institutes across North America who are programming this fall in San Francisco, Toronto, Mexico City, New York, and beyond. Also, thank you to the Monument Lab team who are behind the scenes and part of these programming for all of your work. For this town hall conference, we asked a former Monument Lab fellow and current collaborator, Ariel Julia Brown, who is also the founder of Black Spatial Relics, to, to set the tone for the conference by bringing in a performance. Ariel, in turn, invited the performance artist, Jody, Lee, Jody Lin Kichao. Join me in welcoming them for their brief video performance, Junka Nuakam. Good afternoon, my name is Jody Linky Chow. I'd first like to thank the Monument Lab, Goethe Institute, and Black Spatial Relics for the invitation to speak with you this afternoon. My work questions moments in history as some political views and archetypes may be forgotten and considered insignificant. Since 2018, I've been developing this work titled Junk Canoe Come, a project that is based on the Jamaican junk canoe created during times of colonialism. It is based on the satire created by enslaved Africans, and it is a form of resistance through performance. 
As a Jamaican American artist, I explore the common customs of the tradition that lie between these regions. Junkanoo Akam celebrates this art form through a research based practice with drawings, performance, and media while honoring our shared Pan African heritage. Junkanoo Akam is a site specific, interdisciplinary, interactive project consisting of workshops, performances, and other media intended to decolonize and raise awareness of New York City's historic spaces and monuments, still bearing names of slave masters. Junkanoo is a centuries old ritual and art form based on celebrating freedom. It is a pre abolition satirical masquerade and decolonization satirical ceremony confronting slave masters and practiced during Christmas in parts of the Caribbean. Celebrations include parading with ornate costumes, including grand hats, replicating houseboat mansions, while others entail colorful characters engaging in miming, drumming, and dancing. Its namesake is born from the respect of the 18th century Akon warrior John Connie, who defended his native prince's town or what is known in the present day as Ghana from the Dutch colonizers for more than 20 years. Junkanoo is a performance of freedom. I've read that celebrations of Junkanoo and its variations take place across oceans and continents, seas, countries, and peoples living in Ghana, the Caribbean, and the U.S. The legacy of Junkanoo was carried across the Atlantic in various shapes and forms. It was during the Middle Passage where alliances of various African ethnic groups formed and found ways to communicate and retain their traditions in Jamaica and North Carolina, respectively. I construct my versions of these masqueraders through rebuilding them based on my found research materials, and I invite performers and participants of African descent to explore these extraordinary characters through the act of building their own Junkanoo costumes, each representing archetypes of the past and the role they play in the political landscapes of today. Each day that I sit with the Pan-African tradition of Junkanoo, I ask myself, I wonder what it was like to perform as a Junkanoo reveler back in the days of slavery. In this moment of international reckoning with monuments, I offer that you ask yourself, How can we be in conversation and embodiment with yesterday's monuments, yesterday's heroes, and today's? In our future, I imagine a landscape where we can possibly create our own archetypes of power, hybrid and individual, through creative expression, while paying homage to our traditional ones. Thank you. Thank you, Jody, And thank you, Ariel and Black Spatial Relics for our opening performance. We are now ready to begin town hall. So to introduce the moderator, moderator of our first panel, Curating Memory and Justice. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. Patricia Kim, a dear collaborator, friend, and member of the Monument Lab team. Dr. Kim is also a postdoctoral fellow at NYU she is the founder of the public project Queens Who Rule, which is based on her research on royal women who built monuments in antiquity and across time. And she's the co-editor with me of the forthcoming Shaping the Past book. And she'll be moderating our, our panel. Over to you, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much. 
Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good night to some of you. Um, I'm really excited to be able to uh, moderate this conversation, the first conversation of Town Hall, uh, Curating Memory and Justice. Um, we will be taking questions from the audience. We won't be able to answer every single one, but don't forget to tweet at us. Um, Instagram us, DM us uh, at monument underscore lab on all of the social media. Um, I'd like to now invite the two guest panelists, the two keynote participants, um, Dr. Bonaventure Ndikung and Jasmine Wahi. Um, so Dr. Ndikung is the founding artistic director of Savvy Contemporary in Berlin and the artistic director of Zones Bake 2024, a quadrennial contemporary art exhibition in Arnhem in the Netherlands. He's also currently a professor at the Weissenze Academy of Art in Berlin. And this past year, he received the first OCAD University International Curators Residency Fellowship in Toronto. So welcome, Bonaventure. Jasmine Wahi is the Holly Block Social Justice Curator at the Bronx Museum and also founder and co-director of the Project for Empty Space in Newark, New Jersey. Um, her practice predominantly focuses on issues of femme empowerment, uh, complicating binary structures within social discourses, and exploring multi-positional cultural identities through the lens of intersectional feminism. So how this is going to happen is I will, um, again, field questions, um, sort of help guide the conversation a little bit, but really this is a conversation between uh, Jasmine and Bonaventure, and I'm, I'm really excited about this. Um, so to frame the next uh, hour of discussion or so, I want to start by recognizing the moment, um, which is defined by this groundswell of calls to decolonize institutions uh, and even our own personal lives and relationships. So although this is a movement that artists and activists have long been tending to, it feels qualitatively different, especially over the past year in its audibility and its recognition as communities across the globe, uh, in particular throughout the so-called West, are grappling with histories and systems of structural violence, um, calling for justice across sectors, including and especially in the arts and culture industry. So I'd first like to invite both of you to think about what these calls for justice and decolonial movements mean for the curator, uh, whose role at encyclopedic museums is historically rooted in colonial praxis. Um, and in other settings, curators have this awesome responsibility to really care for the stories and objects of groups of people um, and communities with whom they may not always identify. Um, I think our audiences, well, certainly I um, am interested in your thoughts around issues of accountability uh, as, what, as, what you, as well as what you think about your responsibilities are as curators to the local communities with whom you work, as well as to more global expansive audiences. So um, whoever wants to start or answer first, please do. Um, well, I guess, Bonaventure, would you like to start? No, please, yes, me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is really quite exciting to have this forum to talk um, openly and candidly um, about what's happening in our institutional spaces right now um, as they run sort of in a microcosmic but parallel way to what's happening with social justice movements um, globally. And two, that was a, a big question. So I'm trying to think about where I start. Um, I guess to the question of um, responsibility to communities and uh, it's sort of intersection with decolonizing colonial practice, um, which I think is one of the primary steps in um, decolonizing institutional spaces. So the first part is I think for me, um, responsible to geographic, uh, geographically local communities um, is of the utmost importance. Um, I think one of the things that institutions um, 
larger large institutions have not done so well is being um, focused on communities while also being focused on um, larger global impact. Um, I do think it's a, not only possible, but um, imperative that museums, institutional spaces, cultural spaces, um, see themselves as serving two functions. One, as serving the local communities. Um, and I want to emphasize uh, the plural uh, use of that word because there are not, there are no homogenous or monolithic communities, even in geographical spaces. Um, so to embrace communities while also presenting the best exhibitions that can garner international attention. Um, and I think the idea that the two are mutually exclusive um, does a disservice both to the institution as well as the communities that they are meant to serve. Um, and so I guess I'll leave it there for now and then come back and answer the, the second part of that question. So um, thank you, Yasmin, for, for paving the way. Um, and thanks, Patricia, for the beautiful introduction. And also to Paul and to all the people behind the scene that actually make this possible. You know, uh, we do a lot of these things and we know that it's an incredible amount of work. And I would just like to take some time to acknowledge that. I also particularly liked uh, Paul's acknowledgement on the stolen land on which uh, we all kind of find ourselves, especially those of you in the US, and uh, the displacements that happened, you know, and the extreme violences, you know, from indentured level, slave level, and so on and so forth. So I was really happy to hear that. Now to your question, I, I am not an expert on decolonial projects, so I cannot really say much about that, but I'll say something about, uh, you know, curating within different institutions. It might somehow answer some of the questions or some parts of the question, uh, but in the past years, what we've been thinking about is mostly decanonization you know, thinking of canons and thinking of ways of making canons more porous, thinking of ways of undoing canons, thinking of the violence of canons and so on and so forth. You know, that has been one aspect. So again, I'm not an expert on decolonization, but I will say that uh, one of the most important, um, you know, responsibilities, because you mentioned responsibility, I would say, is uh, mediation, uh, the duty to mediate. Now, mediation uh, shouldn't necessarily be limited to the, the acts of, you know, explaining what is presented within the exhibition to some viewers, but mediation in terms of mediating epistemologies. So the bodies that come in to see the exhibition come in with certain knowledges. So first and foremost, they too are some kind of monuments. So because they carry histories, we bring other histories and we try to mediate this. Uh, the artists come from different parts of the world, so they bring in different knowledges and we try to mediate them. You know? so, so that is the first uh, act of mediation, I would say. The second act of mediation would be a uh, kind of mediation of geographies. So within the kind of exhibitions we do, uh, again, I can't speak for museums because I don't work in a museum. I don't know what most museums do. Some try to do this, some fail. Some fail very badly. Uh, but we're more interested in, you know, the kind of things we do and, and what... Uh, peers of ours do, and this is the mediation of geographies. Uh, understanding that different people come from different parts of the world, different geographies of the world, 
you know, the politics of geography, you know, and the construct of geography. Uh, so the mediation is also in undoing those fictions of geography. Now, uh, having said that, it also means that geographies come along with languages and accents. And it's about acknowledging those differences in the languages and in the accents and thinking of what uh, Edouard Glisson said when he said, you know, there are no relations without differences. So it is in mediating these many differences in geographies. Now, I already mentioned, uh, you know, the bodies. So it's about mediating these bodies as well, mediating aesthetics mediating forms, uh, ways of seeing, ways of perceiving, ways of being in the world. Um, Yasmin mentioned beautifully the communities and the multiplicities of the communities that we find ourselves in, and it's also about mediating them, and of course, mediating mediums and disciplines. So that is what I would say is a responsibility and um, if it so happens that we, in that process, kind of effectuate a decolonization, then we are happy to do that. Jasmine, did you want to um, add on to that or um, go back to the question, or do you have anything to add or respond? So one thing I did want to respond to um, was the idea, uh, the last thing that you said, Bonaventure, was um, if we do uh, affect decolonial change, then so be it. And I think um, my attitude right now in this particular moment that I think has been building up for quite some time, um, and I think many years, uh, for me at least, is that it is imperative um, to take an active stance to decolonize a space and decolonize not just necessarily in a global um, context as far as objects and artifacts um, and the repatriation or recontextualization of objects and artifacts, but also decolonializing on the local level, um, which really means, again, uh, institutions. And when I say institutions, that doesn't necessarily mean large museums um, exclusively. Um, it can also include uh, the smaller nonprofit institutional space or the commercial gallery space, um, any type of cultural space. I think it is imperative that we work towards dismantling our impressions and our histories and to what you said, our understanding of um, canonical art histories and rebuild those structures and narratives with uh, a staunch intentionality towards decolonizing and creating visibility. Um, and I, I am of the belief and for better or worse, um, I'm, a, I'm a may the bridges I burn light my way kind of person. Um, I would like to see all of it deconstructed um, with rigor and uh, I think a reckless abandon so that we can rebuild um, spaces and narratives to be inclusive and to create the visibility that so many of us have yearned for um, now, I guess, for centuries. So um, I think it's fine. It's, it's, uh, I'll probably agree with that, but I am careful about it. I'm, I'm worried about the adjectival lightness as uh, it was pointed out in, in, uh, in Mignolo's uh, book of, of, of the usage of uh, decoloniality and so on and so forth. Now, I do think that some people must use it and do it actively. In our case, 
we want the practice to speak for itself. The practice has to, if it becomes, if it is decolonial, then it so be it, you know. I'm just worried about the labels, you know, let's do things, let's find other ways of calling things as well. The dismantling is fine. We should do the dismantling. We should, you know, deconstruct and so on and so forth. Now, um, there is a long path that has to be covered to reach, you know, the radicality of decolonization in the Fanonian sense. And I think we need to build up to that. I can speak you know, for my context, in order not to lose steam, we need to focus. So the focus is on what we do and how we do it. And then hopefully it might lead to, the, to that decolonial. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so, I, there's so much that both of you have said that I'd like to sort of grasp onto, but I think one thing I'd like to both of you or press both of you on is this question of positionality. Um, and so uh, Bonaventure, you mentioned kind of thinking about um, mediating different epistemologies or different sort of knowledge systems, different histories and geographies to that end. Um, and Jasmine, you're very um, explicit about your practice geared towards these multi-positional um, kind of intersectional feminist uh, perspectives. Um, and so I was wondering if you could both maybe comment on um, this question of positionality as well as intersubjectivity, kind of acknowledging your presence and role as a curator, right? Not just as part of this process of narrative making or and so on and so forth. So um, what do you think your positionalities are as curators? And you can just comment on anything that I've said. <laughs> Thank you, Yasmin. Now, I think my position is a complex one, you know, because um, it's not a singular position, but a complexity of uh, positions. Um, as a, somebody trained as a biotechnologist and practicing as a curator within the art field. So one sees things in different ways, but also, uh, as a person born in Cameroon and grew up in Cameroon and working in Berlin at the moment, I also see things in different ways. So as a black man in society with all the news of the violences enacted on black bodies, so all these things influence that somebody coming from a country uh, that has had the same president since 1982. Um, and the part of the country I come from, uh, from Bamenda, has been on the condition of war for the past four years. So all these things take a toll on, you know, on the practice and to take, no, maybe not a toll, but have an impact on the urgencies of the practice. So the position is, uh, you know, multiple and it is definitely also one that constantly struggles, you know, with precarity, precarities of different kinds, you know, that struggles with um, hierarchies, hierarchies of different kinds, you know. Uh, Yasmin used the word dismantling. And I think that is a very important part of the practice. How does the art and the, you know, different forms of mediating the art actually serve in dismantling you know, what Anibal Kijano called the colonialities of power and the way they are reiterated within the present. 
So how, you know, how to think of the, the, the violences of our day, of our moment as the continuum of coloniality, you know, and how whatever we do, how we can strive towards, you know, uh, dismantling those or unsettling them. And that is done by looking at those histories, but also in proposing other histories, you know, looking at other narratives, looking at, you know, thinking from different vantage points, you know, thinking from vantage points beyond the comfort of the West, thinking, uh, you know, from different geographies, as I said earlier, thinking from different bodies, you know, um, um, but also, as I said, investing in um, the power of fiction, investing in, in, in storytelling, you know, to say the least, you know, Chinu Achebe said in, in one brilliant interview he did in 1987, that uh, when he was asked about humanity and he said, it is in storytellings, you know, it is in storytelling that we recognize our humanity. It is in storytelling that whenever we doubt how human we are, we delve, and that is why all cultures have storytelling. And that our humanity is contingent on the humanity of our neighbor. So I think with this and, you know, curating is storytelling, making art is storytelling, and I think that in doing so, we constantly are reminded of this, you know, very basic notion of humanity and the ability to breathe. So that's it. Yeah, oh, sorry, Patricia, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think I uh, agree wholeheartedly that um, the role of storytelling and narrative um, and uh, as curators facilitating those stories is really our primary role and of um, supreme importance in the cultural space. Um, as a curator, I think my interest now, um, and I think it took me uh, some time to come to this point, but my interest is looking at stories, um, histories, historical narratives, and facilitate and facilitating the um, recontextualization and the retelling of those narratives um, through the lenses of the people or through multiple lenses, but particularly emphasizing the lenses of the people who have lived those experiences. Um, and I think as a curator now, I see my role really far as far more, um, or what I would like it to be is, is far more in the background um, rather than the foreground of exhibition making um, and project making. And what does that mean? That means for me um, bringing in voices other than my own to work on writing narratives, histories, stories, um, including fictions, um, and to kind of create a chorus um, rather than a solo performance. So for example, some of the exhibitions that I have coming up, um, I've invited, these exhibitions are uh, oriented around both object and artifact, but also a retelling of a particular history of um, a particular uh, culture or group. And I'm inviting um, members from those communities to be in community with me and curate collectively, rather than, um, this is my new favorite analogy, but rather than having an Egyptian pyramid, I'm trying to have a Mayan pyramid. So there's a, 
a sense of um, lateral thinking and contribution to creating the arc of the story that we're presenting within the gallery space. Um, and part of doing that is giving uh, my collaborators the title of curator as well and um, financially compensating them in the way that uh, guest curators would be um, so that there is uh, a holistic and as equal of a process in creating these stories that will ultimately be seen by um, a larger public um, and trying to be as horizontal in that thinking as possible. I think the era of the superstar curator um, is over and if it's not, it should be over. Um, you know, perhaps to uh, my own detriment, Bonaventure's detriment, I don't think that curators should be um, primary focal points in exhibition making, which often ends up happening when um, you have group exhibitions and even sometimes when you have solo exhibitions. Um, and I think the time for that is finished. I think in part of deconstructing, dismantling and decolonizing, um, we need to create types or we need to be more inclusive in an active way about the voices and the viewpoints um, that we hear from and that we see. And so my hope is now to take more of a backseat and act again more as a, a facilitator or um, uh, someone who can sort of coalesce a larger group idea um, and bring together multiple voices in a way that's not monolithic, but is also um, cohesive. I feel like um, your answer sort of presaged my next question um, as you're talking about the kind of ethics of care and the acknowledgement of people's labors and their story. Um, and so this next question was, um, what for you is the relationship between memory, memory work and justice? So it's broad, but I'm curious. Um, wow, so I have so many things to say about this, I don't even really know where to start. Um, memory is like everything else that I think we're, we've both said, um, is not a monolith, right? Collective memory is made up of a sum of many parts um, and many voices. And I think often historically, um, you know, when we think about the canon, it's a presentation of one particular viewpoint. Um, and this, you know, this is not just within art, this is within all histories and with all, um, within all sort of cultural structures. Um, and so I think the way to dismantle that and to create new memory, because I think our, our mainstream understanding of history is so flawed. Um, the main way to do that, like I said in my previous answer, is to bring in other voices and not only bring them in, but give those voices um, a highly visible platform um, to share those perspectives and to share those perspectives both as uh, a counter to the histories that have already been written and the memories that we already share in our collective understanding, our mainstream understanding, um, but also allow for those memories to exist on their own. Um, and so I'll give you an example. It's easier to talk more concretely about the show that I'm referring to by just telling you what it is rather than sort of skirting around it. Um, the show that I'm referring to um, will be happening at the Bronx Museum next fall, hopefully, and it is about the um, histories of ball culture, um, which originated in Harlem and the Bronx, and it's sort of an homage to ball or vogue culture um, over the past 50 years. 
Um, and we have seen more recently a mainstreaming of um, what many people would call a subculture. I consider the term subculture to be somewhat of a pejorative um, because it's not sub for the people who are actually living it. But um, semantics aside, um, my hope with this exhibition is to present the story um, or the stories of this history through, again, the lenses of the people who live them rather than through the lens that we're used to seeing, which is through um, documentary footage such as, or sorry, documentary films such as Paris is Burning um, or the other ways that people have come to understand that culture through Vogue or generally through um, the white voyeuristic lens. And so I want to acknowledge those ideas of collection of history, but also acknowledge that there are thousands or many and multi multiples of um, other memories that need to be heard and need to be um, acknowledged and also need to be canonized in a certain way if we are living in a, in a society that values canonical structures um, and codified histories, then we need to expand what those are and also mainstream them again by dismantling the idea of the colonial lens um, and of the outsider lens. Um, and I understand inherently, and I'm happy to talk about this more, but that even in doing this, there's a fraught and problematic structure um, that goes into the idea of pushing narratives um, for the sake of sharing them in mainstream history that can be potentially exploitative. Um, and so that's also something that I'm interested in, in, in creating new memory or new mer narrative. Where is the line between um, positive exposure and exploitation, if there is a line, um, or do the two things exist and you know, the two are not mutually exclusive. Um, and so I think moving forward, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of going off on a tangent now, but um, moving forward with the idea of, of memory making and um, even collective archiving, um, there will be some sort of fraught area that we venture into. You like to respond to that or what was the question again <laughs> it's a the super easy to answer question of um what's the relationship <laughs> Sorry, I talk forever <laughs> between no, no 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 it was brilliant um but asking no, about the relationship between memory and justice. and justice okay now i think um in trying to answer this, uh, we might have to acknowledge the fact that we, okay, I'll put it another way. I, th I think it was in 1995 that uh, Michel Rolf Trio wrote a book called Silence in the Past. So we are living in a moment where a lot of the past has been silence. And so a lot of what we are doing is on silencing that past. A lot of what we're doing is creating a new past and of course futures thereby. Now, memory, as opposed to history, would have to do with finding ways of understanding the multiplicity of ways of remembering that which happened, as opposed to that which is told to us in history books 
through statues, through monuments, and so on and so forth, as that which happened. So finding ways of remembering. Now, it's important to acknowledge that, that memory exists on different panels, in different levels. You know, there's the memory that is obvious that you can see. There is the memory that is not so obvious that, that which actually may be called the deeper memory or the deeper archive. So it's very much about exploring that deeper archive, the memory of the body and so on and so forth. Um, we just did an exhibition um, called The Faculty of Sensing that happened in the Kunstverein Braunschweig, you know, together with Jule Hilgetner, Jule Kashmarek, and uh, 18 other artists. Now, that exhibition was done, or the project was done, and we're cu currently working on the book for that. In memory of, in memory of Anton Wilhelm Amo. So you had artists like, uh, Adama Delphine Fawundu, Anche Majewski, uh, Jean Ulrik Desser, Tio Echetu, a couple of others, you know, coming together to think about and to remember Anton Wilhelm Amo. Now, why is this important? Because in thinking about Michel Rolf Trio's silence in the past, Anton Wilhelm Amo has been more or less silenced, erased from the history of Germany, more to that erased from the history of philosophy. Come to think of the fact that this guy in 1729, so in the 1700s wrote a thesis about the rights of black people in Europe which was something quite significant at the time, being a graduate in law and in philosophy, becoming a professor of philosophy in Germany as a black man at the time, published quite some important work that for obvious reasons have been erased from memory. So this exhibition, it's not even tangential, it's not even, you know, we're trying to look at the work and to remember and think with and through and by Anton Wilhelm Amo. And I think this is what memory can do. And now, why justice? Not only because the work he was writing in 1729 was about justice, was about the right of black people in Europe at the time, and he wasn't doing a kind of a sentimental argument of, you know, these guys are human, therefore. No, you're saying you don't have the right to enslave them because this, 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 you know. So justice, but also doing justice to his legacy in remembering him. Now the question then becomes, who has the right to narrate? Who has the right to tell? And that is the question, the essential question of monument and monumentality, which are two different things. Now, so who has the right? So Glissant talks about the fact that we cannot leave history in the hands of historians only, which is to say it is our duty and making the difference between history with the capital H and history with the non-capital H. You know, it is our duty to remember and the sheer fact, the mere fact of remembrance of certain positions that have been silenced or erased is doing justice. I think that is, uh, that is something that is quite fundamental in the work we do, you know. I can go on and give more examples, you know, but the kind of voices that we work with, you know, thinking about the work of somebody like Halim El Daba, you know, who was a brilliant composer, born in 1924, I think, so the early 20s in Cairo, 
and was one of the most fundamental composers of the 20th century. But if you look at almost all dictionaries of music in the 20th century, he's been taken out of that. So we've been working on that for the past four years, just to, just to remember Halim el Dabel. Just to, now this remembrance goes on so many ways. So we're inviting people like Josh Lewis that had the, the, for, the fortune to play with him in South Africa um, for the Umnyazi Festival in 2005. We're inviting people that have never heard of Halim el Dabel to play his compositions. So enacting that sonic space that he created, you know, we're inviting people to, to write about Halim el Dabel and healing, you know. So the research he did in Congo, the composition he made in 1944, you know, just spending time with the Tsar women, you know, do, and doing this very seminal composition of 1944, um, so we're thinking about these things, which became, you know, a predecessor of music concrete, you know. So, so, is, and that is justice. Nothing else but that, in my opinion. That was really beautiful. Um, um, I want to uh, actually thank you. I'm just, I'm responding as if. I'm like speechless because I'm learning so much from both of you. And um, someone from our audience has a question about access. Uh, Scott Denham from North Carolina asks, um, how do you as curators connect to the classroom, to students, especially who may not normally have access to museum or gallery spaces or even virtual spaces like this, um, especially now in the pandemic? Um, how do you get your work to, to teachers, basically. Um, and what's been successful for you in making these kinds of connections to bring your work to students of all ages? Should, should I? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, now, access happens on many levels, right? So one is bringing the work to the classroom, but also bringing classrooms to us. Um, that is done in different ways by doing seminars. I mean, quite a few of us are teachers, so we teach in different universities and so on and so forth. But there's something that has become very important in our practice. So. I mean, when you talk about access, what do we actually mean? You know, when I was invited uh, to join the Documenta 14 team as curator, one of the first projects I proposed was to do a radio. Why did I propose to do that? Because I wanted access, you know? So I remember sitting in this room with other curators thinking about, you know, doing a kind of a digital online radio. And I said, no, I want to do a short wave. And so when they ask, and I, I say this quite often because I think it's very important, because I said I wanted, I wanted, sorry, I mean, interrupted. Okay. Sorry, I'm in the space, so uh, I just got interrupted. So, uh, so they asked, why do you want a short wave? You know, because, you know, med medium wave, short wave has become very expensive, right? So why do you need that? I said, because I wanted my grandmother to be part of Documenta. And my grandmother is in Mbatu in a village in Cameroon. I want her to be part of it. So she doesn't have internet, it's a myth that everybody has it, you know, so I wanted that. So that is also accessibility, finding ways of bringing whatever we're doing. So we experimented on how to do an exhibition on the radio. So the people sitting in Australia, that were sitting in uh, Mozambique, that couldn't buy a ticket to come to the so-called biggest exhibition in the world could also be part of it. So that is accessibility to me. Now, We've 
since 2013, we've developed a, a structure at Savvy Contemporary of doing exhibitions, which doesn't limit us to the space of Berlin. So I, I'll give one example. In the project we did last year on uh, ultrasanity, we started with a conference and a series of performances in, in Venice, you know, thinking about madness, uh, the asylum homes, the, 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 the ways people were cut out, ostracized from society. The second iteration of the project was in Esawira in Morocco. We had to go there to think with the Gnawa musicians on how, you know, Gnawa as a sonic practice and a, and a ritual, spiritual practice has been used since time immemorial to heal the so-called mad. The fourth iteration was in Lubumbashi in Congo to do a project there together with Sami Baloji and with the whole team of the Picha Biennial there to work on the notion of sanity and sanitation, which Sami Baloji has been working on for many years now, looking at the, the cordon sanitaire, you know, the, the big streets that were built by the colonialists to separate the so-called clean that were the Europeans from the so-called dirty that were the Africans, you know, looking at that, you know, sanity and sanitation. The fourth iteration was then in Berlin, in different spaces in Berlin. So in terms of accessibility, it's about also taking whatever we do to different geographical spaces, different languages. Um, and that is how we, we've, we've, it's a project we've cultivated. Now, one of our major languages, the language we use is Pidgin. Pidgin as a hybrid language. Pidgin as a culmination of different languages. And that is also about accessibility, how we write and how we address the people we're writing to, you know. So, so I mean, accessibility goes also on people with different abilities, you know. So it's not the classroom, it's the least of my problems, to be honest, you know. Just the fact that Savvy Contemporary was founded in Neukölln, and at the time it was founded, I mean, we, I actually could afford to, to put it in Mitte, but it was important to do it in Neukölln, in a part of town with a huge migrant community, you know, where people passing by the gallery, which was a very small storefront at the time, the art space, and kids would come in and say, what are you doing there? You know, seeing, uh, installations, photographs, paintings, and would ask, you know, and they could see somebody like them sitting in an art space, something they would that hardly ever seen before. So that is accessibility, you know. So when Kerry James Marshall talks about the fact that as a kid he couldn't see himself in some of those paintings that were made, and that's how he had to paint people that black, it's also about accessibility who has access to these spaces, you know. So, um, as I said, the classroom, class, classroom is the least of my problems. Jasmine, would you like to add anything to that? Or sure. Um, so this, uh, this um, thing that you just said, Bonaventure, about opening um, a space where people off the street would come and say, oh, what are you doing here? Um, is something that I've also experienced. And I think one of the things that uh, brings me great joy um, in doing what I do. And uh, to your point, I think accessibility um, is also about uh, being in a place where people can see themselves. So um, for us here today, I'm, I'm in Newark and not the Bronx, um, but we often have that reaction um, first in our original location, which was um, in a train station uh, concourse um, where people of all, uh, basically a, a quasi demographicless population would walk by 
Um, and now we're sort of in the heart of downtown Newark. And every time we put up a, an exhibition poster or a installation in our lobby, people are always like, oh, what is that? Um, and have, uh, you know, have an interest in learning more or engaging or having conversations. Um, and we've had, you know, sometimes uh, artwork or installations that are feel a little bit more contentious and um, for certain people and that is a conversation starter. Um, and so I think that's one type of accessibility. Um, to answer the question about um, classroom spaces, this is actually something that um, I've been thinking a lot about at the Bronx Museum. Um, we've been thinking about quite a bit as well, because um, to Bonaventure's point, the uh, idea that everyone has internet access is um, a huge myth. There's a huge technology gap, um, even here in the New York City area. And the question is, in this particular moment where we are um, doing most of our work remotely, how do we create um, points of community and access, particularly amongst young people and um, further to that, young people who already were not, who did not really feel welcome in um, art or cultural spaces for a variety of reasons um, that I think go back to sort of the systemic exclusivity of institutional spaces. Um, how do we overcome that tech gap hurdle? Um, one of the ways is by, you know, something as as simple. Well, it's not really simple, but um, the concept is is simple of putting together kits and information and um, having them physically available to people to take home um, and to engage with materials that our education department has put together so that they can. Um, be making art that is responsive to the exhibitions or ideas that we have um, so that it's a you know time consuming activity that I think many um, adults during this moment need while their children are you know learning from home um, or doing school remotely. Um, another way has been um, we have not actually thought about radio but that's a really fantastic idea. Um, another way has been really engaging the public spaces more um, through rotating programs, um, whether they be murals or temporary sculptures or socially distanced happenings, just so people um, are aware not only that there is art, but that there is also a sense of community and that um, artwork and exhibitions can be sort of uh, launching points for further conversations. So when, um, you know, you can't necessarily bring people into the space, sometimes you take it out of the space to the people. Um, and that's, you know, on a very local level. Um, for me, I, I think my interest is trying to, to be in as, as local um, and localized spaces within my communities to try and um, bridge some of those gaps. Um, but also if, if anyone has any suggestions for um, how to overcome some of those technology hurdles, please share them because I think it is an important thing that we often don't address. Um, and can I go on a, a little mini tangent? Okay. Um, in this sort of political moment, just, I don't know how many days, too few days left to an election. Um, I think we're in a moment where that, um, the fallacy of everyone having access to technology is really um, glaring, glaringly obvious. And um, not only within institutional spaces, although we can assist in um, overcoming that hurdle, but more widely in our, um, you know, American specifically, but in our cultural landscape, we need to do better to overcome these issues of accessibility and not just uh, sort of lean on this crutch idea that um, everyone is on board with a program or agenda, or everyone has knowledge about it. Um, and so the more we can do to disseminate information, even through 
old school way is like, so, you know, something that we're doing with Carrie Mae Weems is putting up wheat paste posters in public spaces about information about COVID-19 um, or putting up artists, other artists projects on billboards um, and on street corners for people to get out the vote um, because there's clearly a disconnect between um, what government thinks is happening and what is actually happening. Anyway, that's my political tangent for the day. <laughs> no, I love your, I love political tangents. I, I love, um, I love political tangents. Um, and what you're saying actually, I think echoes or um, sort of adds on to what Bonaventure was saying about language accessibilities <laughs> as well. Totally. I really, I really love that thought. And there's something else that you said in your answer that um, actually ties into a really great audience question about sort of taking things out to people, making information public. I mean, and that, I think it's important to think more expansively about what public art right, and monuments can be or consist of. And so Anne Hirsch um, says, thank you all for this wonderful conversation. Um, and Anne asks, as practitioners of public art, how do we do that? Or meaning, the, quoting Paul Ramirez Jonas about communicating with the future, how do we do that without using durable but challenging materials like bronze and stone? So thinking about, um, yeah, durable but challenging. Uh, further, is it possible to make culturally relevant place-based physical mo monuments around social justice in bronze and stone? If not, why not? Um, shall I go ahead? Yeah, yes, please. Oh, okay. Um, so I have so many thoughts about public monuments and uh, the idea of permanence of public monuments. Um, I am personally in the camp that there should be no more um, permanent figurative monoliths. Um, I think that the idea of uh, I think the idea of creating monuments of stone and bronze are more durable or long lasting permanent materials is great as long as there is the option to continuously rotate them out because, um, you know, speaking to the idea of memory and collective memory it are, and history, they're continuously evolving. Um, and I think as we've seen with many of the monuments across the world that are historic while they're beautiful and they are reminders of histories. They're a reminder of a history. Now, if we lived in a world that had so much physical space where we could just unendingly um, and infinitely populate the world with responsive narratives as history and memory evolved, that would be great, but we don't live in that world. Um, and so I think that creating monoliths is great as long as we can understand that their permanence should be continuously questioned. Um, now to the idea of creating public sculpture, um, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to refresh my memory on, on the question about materials, um, the specific question. I'm muted. Um, so, Anne asks, is it possible to make culturally relevant place-based physical monuments around social justice in bronze and stone? You answer that, I think. Um, can we do this? Can we um, honor people, I think, or honor memories and stories through other materials that are not as durable? Or are we so beholden to the kind of um, status and value that bronze and stone have incurred because of these sort of histories and legacies that we've inherited. Right. Yeah. Um, so personally, I think we can let go of um, our lionization of certain types of materials. Um, and I guess part of that is my um, affinity towards having rotating and more ephemeral monuments. Um, I think there's so much material that is actually can be used that is more culturally specific in creating icons um, that doesn't necessarily have to uh, play into 
or acknowledge what I consider to be a very Eurocentric valuation of a type of material. Um, so yes, of course, we can continue to create in that way um, using those materials, but I think there is also infinite possibility in using other materials and other, and there's also infinite possibility in being creative and thinking about how we monumentalize and uh, memorialize certain important historic figures um, without necessarily making them the primary focus of something like a movement, for example, because often when you think about um, the monuments that we do have, I think about um, someone who I'm personally not a fan of, but I'll put that aside, but Mahatma Gandhi, for example, in Union Square Park in New York. Um, as this purported figurehead of a movement when really, this is actually a terrible example because I hate Gandhi, but, but um, when, you know, when you think about the movement that came and, and the push to get the British out of um, South Asia, it was not done by a single figure. Um, again, we lionize individuals, but there's really an entire um, ensemble that goes into movement making and drastic social change. And I guess perhaps that's why I'm less interested in the idea of singular figurative monolith and more um, homages to uh, collective memory and collective effort. Would you like to add your thoughts, Bonaventure? I will try. Um... So thanks for that. Um, I do think that any material is legitimate. It doesn't have to be bronze, it could be bronze. It doesn't have to be gold, it could be gold. Whatever. Now, there are other questions in my opinion that are more pertinent than that, than materiality of monuments. Now, if monuments are supposed to serve as mnemonic tools, then one must ask the question, whose memory? Who remembers and what do we remember? I think that's a pertinent question. The question of materiality comes in secondary. Now, materiality becomes important as in what attention do you want to draw? So you can use something flashy and so on and so forth. And how long do you want? How long do you want to remember? I'm getting an interference. If, if somebody might just mute. So, how long do you want to remember? So you choose a particular material. But it's again, something more pertinent than that, which has to do with drawing attention and durability still. Now, I am fond of talking about the work of Otobon Kanga in many occasions, but this particular work she did in Frankfurt at the Porticus a couple of years back, it must've been 2015, in which she presented some work she had done in Namibia. And what I, I found very fascinating in this work was that uh, she'd been looking at, you know, lakes or craters, deep holes that had remained at, on, in, in the landscape. And where do these holes come from? From the German exploitation of minerals from Namibia. So the digging out of minerals left out big holes. And to her, these were monuments. And I find that extremely important because these craters are the mnemonic tools. They remind us of what happened, of the history. We don't need to erect the myth of a monument as an erection has to be dismantled. Now, so the monument as a concave rather than a convex, as something that exists 
something that is already there is actually more important to me. Now, Yasmin pointed at something briefly, but I think it's also very important. Intangible monuments, you know, those that you cannot touch, but that are there, you know. And I think that is also very important, you know. If you think of Amadou Abate Ba, when he, he brought up the notion of intangible heritage, I think it's the same thing, you know, with monuments. What other monuments do we have out there, you know? Now, what if the material we're thinking of is the body, as Caroline Randall Williams proposed in her article last summer? What if the monument is the body? So I want to shift from that notion of um, the materiality of the monument to what the monument actually could be, what the monument actually signifies, you know, and, um, and much more. You know, in the, in the conversation I had with Paul a few weeks ago, he told me something that has kept me thinking, you know, and I've actually modeled my class uh, this, this semester on that, you know, so thank you, Paul, for that. And he mentioned something en passant about, you know, finding uh, that people uh, uh, kind of found time capsules underneath some of the Confederate statues that were taken down in the summer. And I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was brilliant. But the question is, what if we imagined every monument and every statue as embedding in it, as being pregnant with a time capsule? What is that alternative history that we don't know, you know? So besides the materiality, there's some other things, you know? Now you choose whatever material, it could be wood. Now, bronze is very interesting because we think immediately of uh, the kingdom of Benin, with the Benin bronzes, you know, because whatever happened, you know, the guild was called together to remember what happened by making an object, sometimes figurative, sometimes abstract, but it was to remember. So when the British came there and destroyed it in 1897, there was a a museum-like structure hosting all these bronzes because it was meant to be durable. And that's why you find them in museums all over the place because they were beautiful and durable, you know? So thinking about materiality. And just the last comment. Uh, when I was working with Olu Guibe for Documenta 14, material became very important to him because he was building the uh, the obelisk on which he wrote in four different languages, a verse from the Bible, I was a stranger and you took me in. Now that was important. Now he chose concrete for the obelisk itself. And for the wordings, he wanted to have something in gold leaves so you can read it from wherever and also to specify the importance of those words in a country in which there was an incredible debate on issues of migration, but a country that claims for itself a Judeo-Christian culture taking out that verse from the Bible and putting it in gold. I thought that was important in terms of materiality, but there's much more that's important than that. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, just a few comments, things that stuck out to me are th this idea of bringing an intangible heritage. And I don't think we've talked about different kinds of um, sort of monumental spaces, right? We haven't talked about what people call natural heritage, and I do scare quotes on purpose because I think, you know, that qualifier uh, needs to be pressed a little bit, um, but different forms of heritage, um, absence as being visible, 
right? That the like sort of concavity, um, holes in the earth actually signify. So um, I really uh, love those comments. Um, unfortunately, we are at the end of our time together. And so I wanna thank both of our um, keynote panelists, uh, Jasmine Wahi and Bonaventure Ndikun for um, sharing space and knowledge and time with us at Monument Lab. Um, I feel very grateful. I've learned so much. Um, and so everyone, if you can give a round of applause for our panelists, um, I don't know how that can be visible uh, to you, but yes, <laughs> grand applause. Um, now, what I would like to do is to introduce um, Tiffany Tavares, who is one of our wonderful Monument Lab Advisory Board members who will introduce the next part of our program. Um, again, thank you so much for listening in and be sure to follow along with these conversations um, via our social media. Okay, that's it for me. My name's Alicia Wormsley, and I'm based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The project is There Are Black People in the Future. I'm really interested in the stories of black people, and I also am really into uh, science fiction and the reality of, of um, technology and ancestral traditional spaces that technology exists in. So I'm just like ranting with my partner about it and I'm like, you know what, there are black people in the future. And then that just like, you know, stuck and I just started writing it and printing it on objects while the kids were making their zombie films. I was collecting objects around the neighborhood, just like in this anthropological space. Um, of And people started giving me objects. They saw me walking around. You know, and I would print their black people in the future on those objects. When I was doing that earlier work, I felt like I was, it was a ritual or a spell or a mantra that made things, that made it true. And I want people to use the text. I want to expand the notion of like what it means for black people to be in the future. I want to put us in a space where we're dreaming you know, because we're constantly reacting. That's like a tool of the oppressor to put us in a space to be constantly reacting where we ha we never have time to imagine our future. So, cause we're surviving. So it's like, if that can even just give us a s some space just in that sentence. Buenos días, mi nombre es Talía Fernández Bustamante, de la comunidad indígena de San Francisco, Xochipoca. Se encuentra en el municipio de Lerma, Estado de México. Y nosotros estamos trabajando, es el Castillo de la Memoria. Eh, ¿Por qué el Castillo de la Memoria? En Xochipoca, hace más de 13 años eh, que defendemos nuestro territorio la imposición de un megaproyecto denominado, denominado autopista privada. Y bueno, en abril del 2016 sufrimos una represión eh, en la comunidad en donde destruyeron un espacio importante 
que, bueno, nosotros le llamábamos el castillo, ya que hacíamos actividades de todo tipo ahí, ¿sí? ya que eh, tiene un espacio de sanación, un espacio de sanación espiritual, física y emocional. Eh, para nosotros, pues, es, sigue siendo muy importante ir a estos sitios sagrados porque ahí generamos, o ahí encontramos paz. Yo vivo en la comunidad, entonces, eh, cuando se generó la pica en Xochicuautla, este, pues, se me hizo importante no dejarlo de lado, porque, pues, es el lugar en donde vivo, donde he vivido toda mi vida. El que más que hacerlo con mi comunidad. Eh, porque pues, es importante seguir defendiendo, seguir preservando este bosque, estos sitios sagrados, eh, toda la cultura, los alimentos, las plantas medicinales que existen en la comunidad. Mi nombre es Quentin Bussetti, y estoy en Montreal, Quebec. My project is called Missing Black Techno Fossils Here. I see myself as a visual griot. And so with the Missing Black Techno Fossils Here, I feel like I am being a historian because a part of the Sankofanology method is uh, an embedding of stories. And it is a, a way of preserving stories, which is what the griots do. The griots use music and art to tell stories and the stories of the people. For the monuments that I was designing, gender neutral masqueraders, like African masqueraders, having a two-faced mask, and uh, the idea is that the mask over time will change. You know, and so it's not like a mask that you'll see in a museum that's stagnant and that was stolen, but rather a mask that represents a change in society. I'm choosing one person from the past, one person from the present, and one person to represent the future. And I'm th choosing these three people's stories to highlight them because of their contribution to the landscape and to the history of Canada and to the world on a larger scale. And so I'm doing three people in Montreal and three people in Toronto. And really, I'm just trying to preserve these people's stories because I don't see them being championed being celebrated enough for their contributions. So I have Matthew de Costa, the Honorable Mikel Jean, who is the first Black Governor General of, of Canada. And then I have Farrah Freeman, who has an organization, organization called One Free Circle. And then in Toronto, I have uh, Sophia Pooley. And then I also have uh, Jean Augustine. And I have uh, Savan Gibbs Lassie. I'm preserving them through saying that they are our ancestors past, present, and future. Uh, my name is Hadi Khatib, and I'm uh, based in Berlin, Germany right now. Uh, the project name is the Syrian Archive, and the Syrian Archive is a project that was created to uh, build a counter-narrative to this information that is published by all actors in the Syrian conflict um, and we're doing that by collecting visual materials that are published on social media or that we are taking directly from uh, citizens in Syria in order to verify and to analyze uh, and to use it to support advocacy um, efforts as well as legal case building as well as transitional justice uh, for the future of the country. I really see like monuments moving away from, uh, for example, in the case of Syria, a lot of it is on social media platforms. Uh, but social media platforms and how they are dealing with this content uh, and the content moderation issue with social media platforms can really affect monuments uh, in many different countries. Syria is one of them uh, because of the graphic nature of the content. Uh, and this content is being removed and this means that a whole history of a specific country is also being removed. Since the beginning of the revolution in Syria 2011, there has been 
uh, many narrative around what's happening, lots of propaganda, disinformation about the violence that they have faced since 2011. Um, and this narrative was um, produced by the state and also it was uh, kind of um, copied by other governments that are in support of the state. Um, and uh, it was also the narrative that the international community was mostly um, seeing uh, apart from what citizens were actually uh, documenting themselves um, and we focused on making sure that there is a counter narrative to this information making sure that uh, there is other ways where people can uh, get more informed about what's happening in Syria only by looking into the videos and photos that uh, the citizens have uh, captured and published on social media platforms themselves. We are helping this and facilitating this process through verifying and curating these videos so they are easily accessible um, and uh, people then can see them and come into their own conclusion. Ada Pinkston and I am based in Baltimore, Maryland. Landmark is a project that is about the relationship that we have to monuments. What does a monument for all people look like in the wake of the transatlantic slave trade, in the wake of um, this pandemic that is exacerbated by it? healthcare inequality in the wake of state-sanctioned violence against Black people currently. I started to think about the idea of monuments when I was visiting a family member in Mississippi and I was literally looking at this Confederate monument in Jackson and being disgusted by the ways in which there was this contrast, there was this extreme contrast between how well kept this Confederate monument was in relationship to everything else surrounding it. I really want to create a crowdsourced monument where people can vote on the concept and the structure and this monument gets 3D printed and changes every two years. I'm hoping to accomplish a future vision where public space is more liberating for black women, um, where public space doesn't continue to reify signifiers of white supremacy. One of the things that I've really appreciated about this Monument Lab Fellowship is literally having conversations with other people that are doing memory work and being inspired to keep going. Hello from Philadelphia. As you heard earlier, my name is Tiffany Tabaras. I have the distinct honor and pleasure of serving as chair of the Monument Lab Advisory Board. We are so proud of the incredible Monument Lab family, our thoughtful panelists and speakers today, our donors and all of our friends, new and old, for helping us get to this very moment. So on behalf of our advisory board, thank you for joining us for our second annual Monument Lab Town Hall. First and foremost, my sincere apologies for the technical difficulties. What would 2020 be without such a thing happening? Um, the same way we've gotten through this year, the same way I'll get through that moment with a whole lot of grace. And thank you, Paul Farber, for that kind reminder. I do wanna make sure, however, I take a quick moment to provide some um, important acknowledgements. The videos you just watched are from our 2020 Monument Lab Transnational Fellows. These are 10 remarkable artists, activists, and civic practitioners who critically reimagine monuments in sites and spaces across North America and Germany. Together, they participate in dialogues around questions of how to memorialize the past, offering critical and creative memory interventions in public spaces. 
While fellows work in different kinds of media and contexts, their respective projects address long-term inequities in monuments across the globe. Representing the US, Germany, Mexico, and Canada, this cohort of fellows were selected by an esteemed international jury. The word philanthropy comes from the ancient Greek word philanthropia, which means to love people. And that's why we're so grateful for this partnership. We have the Goethe Institute and the BPB for their creative minds and generous heart in loving our people, our fellows. It is because of their investment and support of our monument fellows of the past two years will participate in Shaping the Past, a multi-site exhibition and book project that addresses pressing issues around what, whom, and how to remember in public spaces. We hope you enjoyed those five videos. The other five will be screened on our day two of Town Hall. Again, we wanna thank and acknowledge these beautiful souls and creative thinkers. Alicia Wormsley, Talia Fernandez Bustamante, Quentin Versetti, Hari Al-Khatib, and Ada Pinkston. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of Town Hall. Thank you, Tiffany, and, and thank you everybody for um, the grace and understanding. I think Tiffany, you put it best um, that we're ready for or trying to be ready for everything that this year throws at us. Um, we're going to move on in a moment, um, but I want to, you know, just again, appreciate um, all of you for joining us. Um, we're not able to be in person, but this is giving us an opportunity to connect um, in new ways. Um, and so we will proceed. We will think about how that can manifest deeper connections and relationships over time. Um, and want to thank our previous panel, um, moderated by Patricia Kim, um, Jasmine uh, Bonaventure, how, how brilliant we'll be thinking about it and re-listening to it. Um, if you have thoughts about this or want to keep in contact, you can make sure to follow on social media at monument underscore lab, at Goethe DC, um, at BPB underscore DE. Now I have uh, the great opportunity to introduce our next moderator, dear collaborator and brilliant artist, Michelle Angela Ortiz. Michelle is a Philadelphia-based artist, muralist, educator, and filmmaker. Ortiz is a 2020 Art for Justice Fund grantee, a Pew Fellow, Rauschenberg Foundation Artist as Activist Fellow, and a Kennedy Center Citizen Artist National Fellow among other distinctions. Um, she's also collaborated with Monument Lab on numerous projects, including 2017 Seguimos Caminando, We Keep Walking. And she's currently one of the first artists to collaborate um, on our new platform, the Monument Lab store. You can purchase uh, one of her shirts at monumentlab.com backslash store that reads Libertad. Now have handing it over to Michelle Angela Ortiz for our next panel, Art, Activism, and Shaping the Public Sphere. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be with all of you today. Um, and of course, to be here with Monument, the Monument Lab family, um, and, and also to introduce um, these uh, two amazing artists that we'll be having a conversation with uh, for our panel, Art Activism and Shaping the Public Sphere. Uh, and um, so the two artists that will be joining us uh, and I'll be reading their bios is Paul Ramirez Jonas. Uh, Paul Ramirez Jonas has sought to challenge the definitions of art and the public and to engineer active audience participation and exchange over 25 years. Uh, he has been made public in galleries, institutions, and urban spaces around the world, and he has been an associate professor at Hunter College since 2007, and is represented by Galeria Nara Rosler, I hope I said that right, in Sao Paulo and New York. We also have uh, Chanupa Hanska Luger, uh, a multidisciplinary multi artist of Mandan Idatsa Ari. Arikara, Lakota, and European descent, uh, using social collaboration and in response to timely and site-specific issues, Luger produces multi-pronged projects 
provoking diverse publics to engage with indigenous peoples and values apart from the lens of colonial social structuring. So I'm super excited to have this conversation both with Paul and Chinupa as we are exploring the themes of the of, of the, our panel, but specifically, um, how are we answering this question, which is what is the responsibility of the artists as activists to both their own and or other communities? Um, so we're gonna start the conversation a little bit first in having the artists share um, a little bit about their work and process, and then open the space to dive in deeper with our conversation. Um, so Paul, if you would like to, we're gonna start with Paul first, and he will be, um, sharing a little bit uh, with us right now. I thought I would start by uh, showing a short video. It's about five and something minutes um, of a piece called Public Trust, which was created uh, just prior of the pr previous presidential election. And that happens to be showing again now previous to this new presidential election, both in Denver and Cleveland at the same time. And I, I just think it's an interesting piece to show because of the moment and also um, because of this idea of community and versus community versus public, which I think are very interesting terms. So why don't we just play the tape and then I'll say a few things. <laughs> This is the promise table, and with here you can make a promise. Please take a seat. Are you making a promise together, or are you making a promise alone? Well, we ask people to make a promise, and then we put them along with other promises that we hear daily on the news. So things countries, politicians, weather people have all said that they're going to do. And then we put it up on the board for everyone to see. Sunsets at 701 today. India pledges to join climate deal. Chelsea Clinton vows to stay friends with Ivana Trump. And here's a space for your promise. So have you thought of your promise? Yeah. Oh, okay, wait a minute, let me think about this. I don't think I make many promises. Sometimes so we promise things and our situation changes. I don't think people have made many promises to me, nor would I ask them to make promises I'm to me. more concerned about if I don't achieve what I put out there, I'll be I disappointed in myself. I'm very non-committal, but if, if I, I do, do, I take it pretty I seriously will follow, follow through, through with, something. especially in the public realm. We have a promise! It's funny because there's a lot of things I don't understand about public interaction and there's some things I understand really well. And then there's something where I always feel naive, but it's always turned out true is that I really trust people. If you trust people, if I'm doing a gesture of trusting you, really, not like a simulation of trust or a condescending trust, like really I trust you, then, I feel like people always meet you halfway. Uh, making a promise public has many steps, yes. right? A promise is a way for us to have like a little like contract together. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're going to put it down on paper now. It's both a contract and, and a drawing simultaneously. It also has our seal. And now all this needs to be complete is your signature. Now you have a choice. You can either give us your signature, sure. your fingerprint, or sure. your blood. Which would sure. you like? And put the blood anywhere you want. We have a promise. <clears throat> if you really believe in everyone's an artist, you gotta make space for that. As much as a control freak as I can be about like the font size and the table and all of these objects, then what happens in the space that's literally being framed for the participant I, I can't control that, right? And I'm trying to create a, a really strict framework for you to say something. So it's like, I'm not delivering content as much as like trying to make space for the viewer's content. We have a promise. Yeah. Yeah. In order for your promise to become real, you have the option to make an oath or a vow. We have uh, the US Constitution, the Jupiter Stone. 
hat. I swear to God. Okay, so when you shake my hand, you say the promise out loud. I promise to forgive my flaws. I suppose it's enjoy a your life seems like a better. I would promise to expand people's I horizons. promise to be a bridge that connects people to their destiny. I didn't realize that you like, you know, take an oath and put your name on it and, and they give you a copy of it. If I like frame it or something, I'll see it all the time. So now you're going to see your words and I, I plan to like frame it and carry it see, with that's me. That's why I like it. Yes. Because it will hold me accountable. Exactly. That's I think I'm going to keep this someplace I can see it often. <laughs> I have a lot of hope for those drawings sitting in people's homes for years and years and years. And that is also a public I'm interested in. Like the friend that comes to dinner is like, what's that? Oh, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the story morphs and deforms and lives on. The other promises on the board. I don't know, they don't matter to me. Nobody means what they say. And there's, it's all empty promises to me now. It's sort of like the word love these days. Everyone uses the word love so casually. I think that we are challenged in our, our generation and at this time in life where people are saying all kind of things, especially if you consider, you know, this is the political time. <laughs> There's something I don't understand, which is that at the human level, we trust each other and we believe everyone is wonderful and everyone's a good person. But then as we scale it up, you can see there's a complete breakdown of trust. With this piece and hopefully with other pieces, I want to understand that. I actually don't have the answer, but it is the question I'm trying to figure out. Why is it that these contracts degrade as we scale them up? All right, and now I have two minutes. <laughs> and in those two minutes, first, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Monument Lab, and excited to have this conversation with Michelle and Chanupa. And um, the thing about public trust is that, you know, we are used to this modernist ideal of uh, putting objects in boxes, and then they go to these museums that try to create a neutral, quote unquote, uh, place and therefore that's the way the artwork can move around the world to different communities in different contexts with this uh, forcible creation of white cube architecture worldwide. And I was just interested from previous experience, if I could make a piece that is for people. And I used to say that I was trying to make work that was community specific, not space specific, but could I create a work of public art that could actually move around and I'd be able to adapt. And so how empty would it have to be to be able to account for any kind of voice coming in? And public trust is probably the most uh, complex version of that. It, it emphasizes voice, which previously about half an hour ago in, a, in, in this uh, convening, um, someone's talking about bronze and stone and monuments. And I often think that those materials are, are a violation of, of our own existence because we are ephemeral. What does it mean to create things that will outlast our bodies and our very existence? So I, I tend to think a lot about voice as our material. Uh, our material is ephemeral. It goes out into the wind and it, it just exists for a few seconds. So I try to often make works that use the participant's voice as the material that is sort of held up and shaped or framed in some way. And public trust I'm hoping has an endless um, capacity to adapt and absorb these different voices. And three seconds left. <laughs> uh, so I will wait for the next part of this panel when we'll all get to have a joint discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I, I love seeing the video and when you reference um, really public trust being a framework, I, I think of it also as kind of um, for artists working in communities or working with the public, like how are we creating these vessels to hold the voices 
of community members um, and seeing it that way. And then also just playing with the idea of trust, you know, how we all interpret that is also really interesting. And when you have it as an actual physical document that holds holds you to it, um, is just really, it's, it's really a beautiful nuance to, to the work. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Chanupa, who will be sharing um, some information around um, his work as well, uh, so that we get to know a little bit more about uh, what he wants to highlight, and then we will continue our conversation. Dosha Maragua, Dishkag Nahu Dosha, Netawehu Dosha. I'm Chinupa Hanska Luger. I say to you, hello, my friends. Who are you and why have you come? Uh, this is rhetorical. Uh, uh, I guess I wanted to present a project that I've been, it's been in the works for a while. Um, the iteration that I'm gonna share with you is called Belonging. Um, but I thought it was relevant to the idea of monument and um, monument building and what those things mean and who are they for really. Um, I had done a bunch of research on uh, Buffalo. I'm, I'm Mandan, Hidatsa, Rikara, and Lakota, and have a customary relationship with um, non-human species. Uh, we have, uh, a lot of our society was built around this relationship with Buffalo. And I wanted to, uh, I have a project in mind that I want to, wanted to eventually accomplish, but as a, uh, is a, is a memorial to uh, the Buffalo Nation whose population was decimated um, in an effort to get rid of us. It was a war of attrition. Um, so the, the Buffalo from 1845 to 1895, their population was reduced from 60 million roughly to 1500 in the United States. And uh, we still continue to utilize their bones as as fertilizer um, on the landscape and some of their material was used to construct steel um, here in the United States during the, uh, I guess, industrial revolution. So this country owes a debt to Buffalo just as my people did uh, prior to contact. And so I wanted to share a short video with you that's a, a little bit of a premise on all of that, and then uh, I'll be happy to talk more about it afterwards. So thank you, we can play the video. The land is, the ocean is, the sky is, the earth is and long before we are, but we are the living things. And in this rhythm is our place, not separate, but belonging to something much greater than any single beat. Our edge is defined by its relationship to that which it touches and can be touched, and so it is. There is a story of belonging that began as a blood clot, drying in the grass on the land. As it coagulated in the sun, it wept and sang out loud, certain of its demise. The sad song was heard by the buffalo, and she did not pass it by, but stopped to see what was the matter. The blood clot expressed through the sobs that it was weak, and it would die here, and never be anything but blood spilt on the land. The buffalo replied with a deep breath through her nose that the blood was so pathetic. She first expressed that the blood should be happy, that it is anything at all, and then she proceeded to tell this blood that she was moved by its song, and told the blood that her nation was strong. She then lowered her head and whispered into the blood clot that it could help itself to her blood to increase its numbers, that it could help itself to her muscles to increase its strength that it could help itself to her hide to protect it from the sun and the sky and the weather, and that her bones were strong and they could be used as tools for the blood, and they could learn to take care of themselves and everything else on the land. And then she gave her life up there, and the blood had a chance and a debt, and soon the blood became a people, and the people remembered the debt, 
and gave thanks and made many offerings and took care of the land, and in turn, the land took care of them. Later, a different people came and forced the people to look at the land the way they did. To them it was separate and wild and must be dominated and controlled. The people disagreed with one another and they fought and more blood was spilt in the grass on the land. In order to feed the people who belonged to the land, a war of attrition was declared and the Buffalo Nation, tens of millions strong, were systematically destroyed and the land was void of a powerful nation and it began to suffer its absence. And one people was forced to be like the other and to see the land as something separate that could be owned and controlled. Their songs and dances and way of life were forbidden, forced to put aside its debts and its belongings. But as an extension of the land, their stories could not be forgotten. For their stories of belonging began as a blood clot drying in the grass on the land. Okay, so, um, yeah, I guess my relationship to this place is a place of belonging. Um, I think that somewhere along the lines, we, we convinced ourselves that we were separate from the land. And I think that is one of the greatest travesties of our time and, um, and a lie that we all agreed to participate in. I think as extensions of the land, there is no real way to possess it and to own it. Um, and I think in that, even opening up the conversation of what a monument is, you know, on, in, on this landscape prior to contact, the land itself was monument. Um, several of the mountains that are around where I live here in New Mexico are, are symbols and representations of um, some of the gods to, to the people of this location, to this land. And uh, they are more incredibly built than anything we as simple humans could create. And I think what all of this is coming, you know, comes back to for me is that we, you know, have this old story of, um, the way that we paint our bodies during certain ceremonies. And we, you know, as native people, we were highly conceptual. Nothing was done um, uh, or, or repeated in a way that was realistic to the human eye, but rather it existed as the idea of a thing, the shape of a thing rather than the thing itself. And in that there's room for these things to grow. And um, even when you tell the story of them, they, have the capacity for those stories to become yours or for every generation that retells that story, it becomes the storytellers. And um, the way we used to paint our bodies in, in relationship to the Buffalo is that we would paint red, white, and black. And red would symbolize the muscle, white would symbolize the bone, and black would symbolize the sinew. And of late, I've been kind of thinking about that relationship. Uh, bone is structure. It's what holds up the frame that is our, our experience. Muscle is the will. Muscle is the thing that, that powers uh, us to move through these spaces. And the sinew is the third, you know, um, important kind of pillar to this to this relationship sinew is what connects the two and i think that that connection is incredibly powerful um and just as important as the will to move the structure to move is the connection between the two and the connection between us and everything else um so that's a bit of of what I wanted to kind of talk about. I'm really excited to get into conversation with uh, all of us. And so I just wanted to leave you with that idea. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Chanupa. I think um, what's the, the video is just beautiful. And I think also, um, you know, I was part of a, a conversation recently with a number of um, artists who are working around um, tackling the issues of racism. And we started out with uh, acknowledging the indigenous land that we are, we have our homes in where we live. And um, so I, I really was thinking about two things. One is honoring obviously the Lenape tribe here, uh, the land of the Lenape tribe in Philadelphia, um, but also the tribes that we carry within ourselves, right? Um, and, and that memory of like land, um, there's a flower that just bloomed in my backyard um, of, of a plant that my grandmother smuggled in from Colombia and tomorrow is her birthday, she has passed away, but it actually hardly blooms and it bloomed uh, three beautiful white flowers. Uh, and the smell is just, just takes me back, back to Colombia, it takes me back to my mother's homeland. Um, so it's just really just, you know, when I saw your video, it was just that connection to land and ancestry um, and how, yes, we, it is presented as if we're disconnected to that, but it's so much a part of who we are. Um, so uh, to continue the conversation, it kind of flows into one of the questions that I have for both of you. Um, how does who you are and your experiences play into your creative process? Um, I would say perspective as an artist and, and activist, if you see yourselves or identify yourselves in that way as an artist and activist. Um, and, uh, and yeah, if you can share that with, with, the, with us. Um, and start that conversation there. Mm. Um, well, it, it's interesting because we had a pre-meeting and I was struck how uh, kind of, I, I think I can say this, and all three of us were like, I'm not an activist. <laughs> and, and I was thinking how um, when I was much younger, I had friends who were like real activists, you know, and I was always in awe of them. And I felt like I was the artist and that was a very different Thing to do not that they can't work together but I feel that uh, I, I really have a lot of respect for activists and I would say I am not an activist I think I can participate I think that artists should be citizens and that artists need to be act responsibly and engage society and what's happening in the world um, and uh, but I also think that there's an arc of politics in the art world I think where the discourse moves. So I, I know that I used to think I was not political and then my work did not change and start to be perceived as political. And now I think there's such a fire of activism that I can completely see how my work will be considered not political again, um, just because it's in relation to the culture, you know. Um, but, but this idea that I've been interested in monuments from 25 years ago. Uh, but it seemed like a very nerdy thing to think about at the time. Uh, in terms of who I am, I don't know. I'm from Honduras where I feel like nothing works, but everything matters. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and this idea of the public and community is something that I've been thinking a lot about because you belong to community. Um, but public, at least in the modern way that we think of, is a public of strangers. Right? You go to the concert and you're immersed in a crowd and you're all there and convened for the moment. And part of that experience is, is the not knowing the person, but knowing that you're together in this moment for this cultural artifact versus community where like you are always from the community, uh, even if you leave. Uh, and I think coming from Central America, one of the hardest things to get used to was uh, like modern city life. You know, even though I came from a city, it really was a very giant village, you know, where uh, I always tell this story, my younger brother tried to run away from home and he didn't even make it to city limits because like someone was like, like what's the Ramirez kid doing by himself, you know, <laughs> on this road? <laughs> they caught him right away. Uh, um, so I think where I'm from in some ways is a, is a memory of community and trying to figure out how to create belonging in this larger public sphere in the United States. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but maybe it's a oh, good opening. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm probably, I mean, once again, <coughs> excuse me, we had talked about 
this idea. And I also, you know, don't necessarily identify as an activist for the exact same reason as uh, Paul. I mean, and uh, you as well, Michelle. We have allies and accomplices who are activists who who have devoted their lives to um, putting themselves in those spaces and to standing up for all of us. And you know, I'm hyper aware of um, what privileges I have as an artist, as as a maker, and um, and I guess it's about being responsible and um, and maintaining integrity within within. Uh, the privilege and the sphere that I that I operate in, and you know, I think that that is something that's probably true for all of us. Like you know, I consider myself an artist because I've been told I am such, but I I really do like the idea of uh, like a social engineer or something. You know, somebody who who builds these bridges between communities, between cultures, between um, between spaces that are hard to define to really become that sinew that I spoke of earlier, you know, to help yeah. make this connection. And um, a lot of this too, you know, goes back to uh, how I was raised. You know, I was, I was born on the Standing Rock Reservation in 1979. And that year is significant because it was illegal for us to uh, practice our religious ceremonies until 1978 in the United States. And so, I'm like of a first generation that grew up with access to our customary practices where it wasn't, didn't have to be hidden, didn't have to be um, sheltered and kept secret. And I always think about how um, growing up, I didn't really understand how special that was. And it wasn't until I got older uh, that I realized that there was a generational gap between myself and my generation who had access to all of this um, uh, through great effort of our ancestors, our parents and our grandparents. Um, and so all of that, you know, goes back to this idea of who I am and who community is, you know, um, I'm an extension of that. I'm a part of a continuum, you know, I'm the, the, the edge of a really old knife, you know, that that's, that's what I am. That's and a great, uh, uh, a great reference. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and you know, and I'm not the edge anymore, really. You know, I'm I'm slightly behind my my children. You know, um, mm. and so how do we continue? How do we continue a representation of of ourselves as such? You know, um, being a part of 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 each other. You know, um, being defined by each other. Uh, relationship is is uh, a major aspect of what I understand about who I am. You know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's something that I think is significant and that, um, kind of moves and motivates me. Yeah. yeah and I, I, oh, go ahead. No, go, I, go, go, go ahead. I was just thinking about, you know, when, when we, and how we all reacted to, to the word activist. And I think if anything, um, as you mentioned, whether we're building the framework, the vessels, uh, the spaces in which we can tell stories, amplify the stories. Um, I think of my work as an artist as creating these visual platforms for those stories to be amplified and um, seeing uh, activists and organizers who have dedicated their entire lives in, um, in pushing um, for social change within our communities is really how do we work together? How do we see our work as our work as artists? for me personally is, is trying to find that human connection that sometimes um, is not at the forefront uh, in, in the demands, let's say, or, or it gets lost in translation because it, the being direct is so urgent. So sometimes there is no space to kind of unpack conflict, no space to um, unpack also just the possibilities or reimagining how to combat these systems but in a way that still holds uh, at the forefront our connection to our ancestors, our love for one, each, for one another. You know, one thing that activists and organizers always say that it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it is about expressing rage and anger over the situation, but deep down it is about love for our communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like as artists, we're able to present a different perspective and even reach other audiences let's say in these cultural institutions and other spaces that don't necessarily 
uh, even know that this is happening or are not uh, equipped or having the knowledge on how to take action, how to be good allies. And so I feel like um, for us, it's the art is a way to sometimes just that door uh, to open for, to advocate for that change versus us solely being the people, we're, we're part of that network of uh, all of the folks that are moving towards that movement of change. Um, Paul, did you wanna add one more thing to that? Cause I'm gonna go right into our next question. <laughs> well, no, no, what, what, when Chinupa mentioned his children, I was thinking like, it, it goes back to this idea of permanence and monuments, right? It's like, he's like, oh, my kids, it's like, yeah, my daughter's already so, I, like, I'm such a dull, dull blade. I, I don't even think I'm a blade to her. You know, I'm so dull. I'm a fork now. And, uh, but it's like, so how do you create a, a, an artwork that is where you both need to control it because you are, we're artists, we make form and that requires control over form, right? You shape it. And at the same time, try to get out of the way so that change can happen within it. And the ethics of that are are tricky, right? Especially in a, such a divided country. Like if you put a piece out there and, you, and for example, I think that the public sphere needs to be kind of healed in some way right now. Uh, but that means that I have to be okay with dissent and I have to be okay with people whose opinions are radically different than mine. And, um, and that's where I think I'm different than an activist because I need to put my own agenda slightly my agenda has to be a little bit more general. Like my agenda has to be like, I'm an activist of creating an open space for people to speak and listen to each other. But my own political agenda has to take a backseat a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in that situation. Well, that leads us right into the next question, which is around ethics and responsibility and thinking about it, uh, thinking how those two things are present in your process when you're engaging the public and engaging communities um, you know, I, I think of it specifically around when you are working with communities that are directly impacted by an issue where trauma has been present in their lives or there is conflict, this dissent that exists in communities. Um, how are ethics and responsibility present in your process? And I would just say in general, or if there's, you know, people just look at us and like, oh, all these artists are so great. They make they just make magic and they don't understand that also there are obstacles that we go through, that there are challenges in the work that we do. Um, and how, how are we being mindful in our process around ethics and responsibility? So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how are we, how are we being ethical and mindful? Um, I think that there's a lot of ways to, to negotiate that. Um, the thing that I really lean into uh, personally is just, you know, once again, going back to where I come from and how I was raised, you know, uh, thank you, mom, you know, uh, thank you, grandma, thank you, grandfather. The things that I was told, um, just as like a customary practice that was embedded in, in, in our, the way we lived on, on the planet, the way we existed, was that it's, it's more important to put more in than you take out, you know? Um, and, and I think as artists, as we, as we begin to work with communities, there is, um, there's an extractive quality to that, you know, an extraction of story, even if we, if our intention is to amplify and to help and to support, we are drawing um, and extracting from those communities. So I think it's really important that we um, try to put more in than we take out of, out of those uh, spaces. And, uh, you know, that is, that's a, that's a, that's a hard nut to crack there, you know, because um, there, when you're working with community, you're not working with one individual, you know, and if you're working with an individual, you can always check in and reference and find out whether or not you have um, fulfilled your end of this uh, bargain, this interaction. Um, but when you're working with community, you always have to understand that you're also going to hurt somebody, you know, like there mm. is going to be somebody who is going to be, who's not going to agree with you. Um, but I think also, you know, as Paul said, we, we exist and operate within a space that, um, yeah, we have to recognize and uh, that 
the antithesis of what we're trying to do is also true in those situations, you know, um, especially in this strange political time and polarization of, of people like we're not going to make everybody happy, you know, um, right. and maybe that's not what we're intending to do, but just opening up the, the space for communication, you know, um, I can build you a bridge, but I can't make you walk across it, you know. Yes. Yeah, I, <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. It, no, and, and I always say this to younger artists. I say like, the art world or art doesn't exist in some magical kingdom other than where it's like it exists in this world, right? So we exist in extractive capitalism. And so, and that's where we're creating our projects. And uh, so it's, it's hard because anything from the permitting to the fundraising, to the paying people to do things for you, it's all uh, in this system, right? And, mm -hmm. and Chanupa's right, it's like you try to uh, put in more than you take out. And, and sometimes I think the ethics have to go throughout, like uh, am I gonna go on Amazon and hire the cheapest thing I can from China or I'm gonna try to find someone in the States uh, who makes the same thing and it costs twice as much. Oh no, they're like right-wing veterans. Uh, it, it, like, oh, oh, what's the right choice, you know? And, and which one saves me more money? Or who do I hire to help me? Or everything, it just snowballs, right? And, um, but I think all to say is that you're trying to make a space in a society where it doesn't quite exist almost anywhere, right? And at best you can create a temporary uh, manifestation of that space. Um, and also the responsibilities change. I think a lot about uh, the only project I've done in Honduras where I'm from, and that project was so precise and so opinionated and so specific to that community and addressed people very specifically. And that means that I cannot show that project outside of that community. I, I've tried once and I regretted it uh, because back to community and public, that was made for a community and it should remain in that community. I don't understand how it can be shown outside without becoming extractive in some way. Um, and that's hard because I'm an artist. I have an ego. I want everyone to know that I made this, you know? And uh, <laughs> uh, so I don't know that there's a clear answer. You do your best, I think. And uh, try, to, yeah. try, to even do, try to even do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I always think of every project, every exchange is pretty much a learning lesson, right? And as we move forward, you're like, okay, this is what I will do next. Not to say that there wouldn't be other obstacles that um, present themselves, but it is a process, right? The same way as we're in our studios and we're kind of figuring out the fonts, figuring out what materials we're going to use. In that same way, how we engage with communities, the questions that we ask are the questions we, we don't ask. We let the, mm -hmm. the community itself say, okay, these are the things that are important to me. This is what's valuable to me because we can come in with our own agenda and just checking ourselves and our own privilege, um, understanding where we stand, I think is super important and just asking, continuing to ask questions, right? Um, not not in, the, in the space of uh, people pleasing, obviously, mm -hmm. because then you can't get to nowhere. But I feel like what is defining what what is the intention? What's the integrity of the work that you want to maintain? What is uh, what I've been putting at forth with my work is joy, impact, and healing. And so, how am I manifesting that in the work that I'm doing and my conversations with community and vice versa? Um, this leads us to. Um, the next question, which is really around um, both of you presented uh, and have a trajectory of work around community participatory um, actions, having uh, the public be part of your work. And so how, uh, you know, under the quarantine that we're all experiencing in this world, um, how has that shifted the ways you think about working with communities and visualizing participation? <laughs> well, uh, I, I would be happy to go first on this one because the way that I've done uh, social engagement projects has been actually not really um, affected by us being in quarantine. 
um, I started using social media as a platform and making small videos um, to have people participate in, in making a larger object collaboratively. Um, what I do is I create prompts for people to participate. And, um, and I think a lot of that came out of, um, I didn't start working in, in the scope of like social practice as we would define it um, until the Dakota Access Pipeline um, engagements up in, up in Standing Rock. And I, I started to see the amount of, um, I'd never seen Standing Rock like represented in any sort of way until then on a public sphere. And then it was blowing up on my algorithms uh, through through social media, um, through Facebook. And so I started looking at that, um, that space and uh, basically responded out of desperation to create mirrored shields. And I and I and I made some in in the parking lot of a uh, of a large box store, um, large box hardware store. And but that that concept. I, I realized that moved through because it what I was seeing was that social media was a river that was wide and shallow. Um, the reach and access was massive, but the return other than the like, you know, little oxytocin push you get for liking and sharing and having people like and share your, your posts is different than um, participation. And so this is how you transform an ally into an accomplice. You, you make them invested. Um, and so whether that's money, I mean, oftentimes the easiest thing to invest is money um, if you have it, you know, but what's, what's stronger than that is actual participation to make something, to, to offer your time rather than money. Um, time is incredibly valuable and the less we have the more you know valuable it becomes so at, at, um, using social media I've I've created prompts small videos for people to participate to make an aspect of an object you know a piece of an object and then share it and um, uh, I have a couple of projects that are, that are up right now one called something to hold on to and a new one that I just started um, with another artist named Marie Watt um, called each other. And these are just projects where people at home in their bubble, in their safe space can um, creatively participate, make a donation of time um, and create something. And then we'll put them together collaboratively. So as of, as of right now, like the way I think about it is different than, um, than how I, you know, how the, the, what's limiting us today is actually been supportive of how I've been doing these projects in the first place. Interesting. It's funny because I, I want to say that, that, well, I'm not doing anything and it's a disaster and uh, I, I'm just keeping it together. But then it, that's actually not true. It feels that way. It feels that way, but that's not what's happening. Actually, I think because I don't think of the exhibition space as the only space where you can do art. It, it actually, it's a, some of the least desirable spaces to make art. I realized like, well, actually things are, are fine. You know, I, I, I just probably finished a project at Socrates Park, which is a, a, a monument that's almost like an obelisk, but the base has five entries. So it's, it's a barbecue. And then we work with the parks department to, because I wanted the public to be able to make fire, which of course you can imagine how people feel like no way, but then it's like, but it's a barbecue, then it's okay. So uh, we, we made part of Socrates, which is a city park, a designated barbecue zone. Therefore, people can make fire in the sculpture uh, because they're cooking. And then the smoke of all the five grills comes together and comes out through the top of the monument. And, it's, and it has viewpoints so people can cook and see each other. Uh, e each cook can see at least two or three other cooks. So each group that came to the park to cook can actually make eye contact and maybe start a conversation. And what's interesting is this was made through the pandemic. It took twice as long to make. And because it's outdoors and in a city park, it's actually working. You know, people are, and, and I also like to use social media. And, and, and it's interesting. It's like social media is interesting and real actual space is interesting. Um, yeah. And uh, the middle, I don't know, it's very confusing. Uh, the museum is very confusing. The gallery is very confusing, but like a park and Instagram, I totally understand. <laughs> or the street and Instagram. So 
things are happening, but I am worried that if it keeps going, I'm going to start running on empty because the lack of, of contact, these are projects that started before the quarantine. So I have the memory of interacting with people, but mm -hmm. increasingly I'm interacting with less and less people. And, and at some point, I don't know what happens. I'm starting to work on a sticker book because I figured like, well, that's a way that interaction and participation can happen in a very intimate way, uh, you know, through a multiple that's distributed. Um, but we'll see, it, it's not easy. I mean, we're, we're animals that like to be with other people. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's interesting though, because I think what we're leaning up against here um, is that, you know, we celebrate art as a as a as an object and as a noun as something where people come and gather to 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 view that but that object is really just the the byproduct of something really beautiful and really special you know the the process that we're talking about and engaging mm -hmm. with with public and people that's actually where this thing is the most beautiful you know um what it culminates to become i mean i think about this even in my own practice like the thing that I end up making with all of the participatory objects that people make is just the echo of that, of that process of that participation, mm. you know, and, and um, I don't know, like this time is really challenging these, these public spaces, you know, especially museums, galleries, kind of, kind of spaces where it's limited, uh, uh, you know, possibility of going to, uh, but it's still the, the power of making something together you know, you don't have to be in direct proximity, especially as we've created so many different ways to interact with one another. Um, so I think one thing for artists is that we're, our knees are always bent, you know? Um, <laughs> we don't know when the ground's gonna fall out from underneath us. Um, the, the, the system that we operate in is in incredibly fickle, you know? So we always have to remain nimble and able to pivot. And that makes us, um, <laughs> that makes us really, uh, uh, resilient in times yes. of dramatic train change, you know, whereas the institutions and, and the brick and mortar of our society, that ship's hard to turn, you know, but people, human beings, living things like we're hard to perish. We don't know how to give up, you know? Um, and so we, um, so we continue, you know, there's something really beautiful about that. Yeah, my friend Patrick Killoran, when we went deep into lockdown in New York, told me something via Zoom that really stopped me in my tracks. He said, well, at least we're still art, like we're still artists. Like all this has happened, but we're still artists, you know? And, and I was like, oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think also as we're pivoting and shifting uh, to all these changes, um, my last question to all of you, um, is, you know, how are you taking care of your spirit at this moment? Hmm. I, I think I'm just communicating more with people. It's oddly enough, I'm communicating more than before. Uh, so I'm communicating, especially with my family, a tremendous daily, uh, several times a day in ways that uh, I didn't before. Um, that's really seems to not through any plan, but that seems to have been, it's interesting what you fall back on. Right. But it's like, suddenly it's com communicating even more with your tight group of people. Uh, mm -hmm. In my case, that has become mostly my family. Interesting. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm in the exact same place. What has been most beneficial for me has been, um, the sheltering in place aspect of this pandemic. Um, I'm fortunate to live rurally. I live um, in New Mexico, uh, so-called New Mexico. And uh, I live <laughs> up on this Mesa, um, Glorieta Mesa, and it's through a mountain pass. Um, the It's like the southernmost pass in the continental United States um, through the Rocky Mountains. And so, I live in a thoroughfare, like people have traveled through this space. Um, people, living things have moved through this space for time and memorial. And now there is, you know, highway or interstate 25 that runs through it, um, coincidentally. And uh, prior to the pandemic, I had been on the road 
I mean, I was home maybe three months out of the year um, and not all at once, you know, broken up um, and was on the road quite a bit. And, and it, the, the pace at which I was operating prior to um, sheltering in place was not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I forgot why I was working so hard other than just uh, working hard, you know, um, like I, I forgot what my, what my purpose was rather than just what I was doing. And so being home, I have a, I have a eight year old and a six year old and my partner and um, I was, I was neglecting them incredibly. You know, I was, I, I thought I was doing all the work that I was supposed to be doing to provide the space for them. But then I did not receive any of the benefits of what I had been providing. Mm -hmm. You know, I forgot about yeah. how incredibly important it was to, um, to connect and engage with, with uh, my family and my boys. And I mean, honestly, the, the, the sheltering in place has been huge for my, for my spirit and my soul, as far as, uh, um, remembering why I'd been working so hard. What, what, what was the yes. point of, of all of that effort, you know? So, uh, I give, I give tremendous thanks to, um, to the suffering of people in the world. You know, I give tremendous thanks to, to a, um, a microbe that has made me recalibrate my, my reason and purpose. Um, you know, I give thanks to the suffering of, of, of many, you know, uh, in order for me to learn that one simple and little thing that is, um, you know, as we're talking about community and community engagement, uh, you got to make sure your, your immediate community is strong and solid before you attempt to engage outside of that. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? Um, and so mm -hmm. this has been a great opportunity for me to reinforce and build up that bond, you know, a family first. So I totally yeah. hear you and thinking of my home as a sacred place, how I'm building that sacred place for my own family um, and being more grateful on what I have available to me, who is around me, what is the support system that, um, you know, has always been there, but just having that whole other level of just appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, we have some questions from our public uh, that I will be sharing. And uh, we have a little bit of time to uh, respond to these. Um, this is, uh, th there's no name, this is an anonymous question um, directed towards Paul. Um, you talk about trusting the public when it comes to making work for the public spaces and you've used ephemeral media like cork to investigate monumental forms and languages. Have you installed your work in Cork outdoors in a public space? Uh, and if not, why not? And if so, who can, should fund that work? <laughs> uh, well, um, I have, it's, it's a technical issue. I mean, I, I have put the more simpler cork works which are just big boulders where instead of having a, a bronze plaque it's just a piece of cork and people use them as bulletin board so it looks like a monument we use it as a bulletin board and those were put outside for the Mercosul biennial in, in, in Brazil and uh, and they held out okay you know um, but then the problem is that the other ones that are shaped like the like I've made a life-size uh, equestrian monument uh, made of cork is that it was I came this close during Occupy Wall Street to putting it in the back of a truck and just dumping it into Cody Park uh, but I I was too precious it was so hard to make uh, and it was so expensive and and the, the glue is not really waterproof and it would have just fallen apart it would have lasted you know for, for a little few weeks so uh, it's more of a Tech, I think it could be done. You could make a cork monument that can go outside. Um, but, but it's back to like, are we trying to, there's something to be spoken about the imagination versus the reality. Like, I don't want to make Hollywood movies. Like if it ends up make, costing like half a million dollars to make a public monument, it, I, don't, I, I don't know, right? So um, it's easier to put it indoors, you know, uh, 
then yes. Uh, so um, it, it's an interesting question. I think that there's, if it's gonna be outdoors, then I'd rather do something slightly different. I don't know if that answers the question. It's possible. It's just, I don't know if it's worth the expense. Thank you. We have another question for uh, Chinupa. Speaking of pivoting and shifting, can you talk about the evolution of the Settlement UK project and the impacts of moving this very public project virtual? Yeah, shifting and moving. Uh, so <laughs> I was, uh, this is, yeah, this is one thing that has been challenging in the, in the scope of um, a pandemic global travel and this sort of thing. I was uh, given the opportunity to do a project in relationship to the Mayflower 400, uh, 400th anniversary of the Mayflower. Um, and uh, I decided what would be great is, um, I was asked to do a project in Plymouth, UK. And um, what I realized, and this is just from travel to, to Europe throughout, there is a romantic idea of who native people are um and and we are all under one umbrella like the the diversity and the complexity we're one dimensional you know and uh to the to that gaze and so i thought the best thing to do was to bring um 30 artists to the uk and build a physical um creative occupation in um plymouth uk and we would do uh we were all hyper contemporary native artists, uh, indigenous artists uh, from the US, Canada, uh, and the Pacific. Basically, we we're focusing on regions that um, were affected by British colonialism. Um, and then also just the concept of colonialism throughout. And we wanted to bring these narratives to Plymouth, UK. And we, um, we can't, we can't go. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're from so many different nations to even organize traveling us to that space after in the, in the wake of a pandemic and then sensitivity of, of indigenous people to, to the pandemic and travel. Um, we had to be hyper aware of all of that stuff. So we decided to create a digital occupation rather than um, a physical occupation. And that opened up really interesting ideas actually, because the framework for online um, practices are like the idea of it conceptually is very indigenous. Like it's an open platform for communication. It's a it's a hub for creating consensus at it, in its best you know iterations. But um, but it's also you know highly um, um, I guess commercial or or. Um, um, capitalistic, you know, this, this platform. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how do you decolonize a space that can't really be colonized? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you engage and create a digital occupation in a landscape that is, um, borderless, you know, hmm. um, or how do you reinforce some of those ideas and, and try to repair any damage of perceived borders, you know, within this digital landscape? Um, luckily, the 30 artists who I've been working with have been so, um, you know, were initially uh, uh, upset that they couldn't go to the place because, honestly, as far as funding for this project, most of it came in kind from each artist to participate in this project because it was so interesting and captivating to go to Plymouth, UK, like this hub for colonial um, ships uh, across, the, across the globe. And to work in that space was they were really excited to do that, but um, we've shifted and changed uh, with our with our bent knees and our nimbleness to create a digital space, um, and that actually really opened up a really interesting conversation. Which was now we're asking these artists to produce and create pieces um, in their home, in their place, where they are, and we share that on these on these platforms, um, and also like. If this is the new exchange, you know, if this is the new gathering place, if this is the lodge where we come together and um, make an exchange, share gifts, share knowledge, um, how do we lean into that, you know? And how do we how do we um, <laughs> how do we decolonize that? Or, or more importantly, how do we reindigenize this space? Like, how do you how do you engage on a digital platform from an from an indigenous perspective um, rather than trying to dismantle something that's falling apart, you know? So. Um, yeah, we're doing it. We're doing a good job. We're, it's 
it's the crunch time right now when we're putting together this whole website um, and uh, social engagement projects. Um, there'll be a big launch on October 13th for it. So um, join us if you can, settlement. <laughs> it's interesting. Sorry, go. Uh, no, Michelle, you go. It's, uh, the, the next question is actually still just building on what uh, Chinupa had already um, shared, which is, uh, and I'll just read it out and we can continue this conversation around this topic. Um, uh, so it says you've outlined projects and uh, that engage participation in the physical and virtual space. How far do you think either of these spaces can claim to be public? And um, how far can actions in these spaces accomplish the same goals? So if you were going to respond to what Chinupo was saying, it's okay because it's still is speaking mm. to the same question. Well, this, the, something that like, fired on my mind when Chinupo was speaking is like, I, I keep looking at, the, at his background, right? And I keep looking like, is that an extension cord? And, and like, oh, right, that's the kiln. And, and I was seeing like, if, if this wasn't <laughs> happening, we would be like art objects. Instead of going into crates, into white cubes, we would all get on planes or something and end up in a very normative looking room behind a table. Uh, people would, we, right now we can't feel the people, the 200, 198 people who are here. But if we had not had the virus, they would be sitting in a grid, you know, of chairs, making a geometry that's very, stringent and I feel like there is something to be gained is that we are speaking to each other in our contexts mm -hmm. you know and and that there's a richness to, I mean so it's a great loss yes uh we're not feeling we're connecting to the three of us but we're not connecting to the full group but we're connecting differently which I think is an interesting I wish we could have it both ways right uh it, it's like uh, there's something amazing about actually having this this discussion without having to travel to some neutral institutionalized space. We can stay mm -hmm. in our spaces. We don't have to dress too formally. Um, and and uh, and I was thinking about this project of not going to Plymouth, right? But then everyone's in their site, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and that creates a texture that's very different and richer, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, even conceptually, like, if you want to talk about decolonization, if you want to talk about re-indigenizing spaces, like, um, there was always a conflict of the idea of us building a settlement in the place of a settlement, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So now that we're not, that's almost like a better lesson to be learned. Like, you want to decolonize? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't <laughs> yeah. you know so th there's there's something there's something in that you know or creating the concept of it even the word settlement we always played around with it as um not necessarily the physical location but like from the legal definition you know um we need to come together and have these conversations otherwise we reinforce some of the things that we forgot why we started doing them in the first place yeah um and i think in response to the question here uh, we can't know how this is going to change us, you know, um, we had been practicing, you know, um, communicating through digital landscapes. I'm 41 years old. I feel like I am um, not the same kind of human beings that are um, who were born with this level of access to communication. You know, if communication is fundamental to um, to our experience as a species when communication changes, how does that fundamentally change us as a species, you know? So um, asking somebody who's 41 years old to, you know, uh, wax poetically about the internet um, also undermines the, the fact that um, the, all the dendrites in my brain were, were wired up first in a completely different way, you know? Um, face-to-face -face communication, eye contact, like it drives me crazy that I looking at the camera or looking at the images of the people changes my eye position, you know, um, mm. it, and even interacting with each other, like it drives me crazy not to have that, um, that face-to-face -face kind of like human interaction. But this is a, this is a human interaction, you know, this is a part of it. And um, I don't know how that's going to I don't know how that's going to change us. You know, I don't know how that's going to change what is public, what is private, you know, um, 
whether you had to register to come on to this conversation or not, you know, um, if you, if it's played again later and it's not live, does that change, um, what the con, you know, what conversations were opened up? I don't know. All of this stuff is, I think, really intriguing and really kind of exciting to figure out, um, what's going to happen, you know, but throughout history, we have, we have adapted to incredible differences, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of that comes to what's our responsibility, not as individuals, but as, as, a, as people, you know, as a society or as an extension of living things. Like, how do we, how do we, um, how do we make this form of communication? Uh, uh, how do we normalize it in the way that say maybe trees have normalized the, the communication through mycelium with their roots? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a really mm. cool old internet, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it doesn't fail like <laughs> the way ours does collapse and, and limit, you know? So how do we, how do we make these bridges from what we understand as artificial, you know, or, or not as close as an intimate, um, but like find analogs for that in our, in our natural world and uh, maybe start leaning into that a little bit more. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know because part of me feel, I keep going to this phrase of like the crowd witnessing itself. And I feel like that moment where if, if I were in the audience of this panel and, and I'm like, start to get a little bit maybe distracted by what we're saying and, and my eyes wander and there's like, wow, there's only 10 of us or mm, there's 200 of us or, oh, I think I've seen that person before or that moment where you recognize yourself can't, I don't know that it can happen in this platform the same way that if my screen says that, you know, 41% of New Yorkers want to defund the police, I'm like, hmm, versus like, if I look out my window and there's a, a, a group of 300 bikers doing a Black Lives Matter uh, critical mass thing are going down my street, that has, uh, when do I physically feel the possibility of change, you know, mm -hmm. or when do mm -hmm. I feel a real embodiment of these ideas? And and I'm worried that we really still need physical space. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, um, and it's, it has terrible limitations and terrible possibilities uh, as this space does. Uh, well, we can continue with the conversation like forever, <laughs> but we need to end. <laughs> I just wanna thank you both for um, being so present and honest and authentic in talking about your process and work and, um, responding to these um, important questions. I think, uh, you know, I pose these questions mostly because, you know, we talk about our process and skill, but I think it's also important to share ourselves as artists and, and our process of, um, and how that's influenced by, you know, just our own personal experiences, our perspectives. Um, so thank you so much uh, for sharing. Thank you, um, thank you Michelle. And, and sharing you. your time and your spaces. Um, <laughs> so we will be concluding this, uh, the panel right now. I would like to also thank the uh, Monument Lab team who's been behind the scenes uh, putting all of this together and, and uh, supporting uh, this conversation. Uh, Monument Lab Town Hall, Shaping the Past, will continue tomorrow. Friday, October 9th from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And tomorrow's program will include two panel discussions, Memory, Trauma, and Transformation featuring Daniela uh, Schillerland and Mabel Wilson and Confronting Art and History featuring Seth Rodney and Mirhim Sadoff, as well as video presentations from the 2020 Monument Lab Transnational Fellows. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you are finding uh, moments to take care of your spirit and that you and your loved ones are all safe and well. Take care.